individuals of the most uh, prevalent species, the next one, so on and so forth. And then you can do the same thing for cities, right? How many professions are there or whatever, right? Industries there are in a given city and so on and so forth. Uh, and it, uh, my guess is that many of these obey similar distributions, but the scaling laws might be slightly different, meaning uh, the ratio of the first to the second and third might be slightly different across uh, these ecosystems, but it'll be interesting to find out just what the best fit is going to be. Okay, and that will tell us. So one question, and which is a question that complex systems people worry about a lot, uh, is are there essentially general principles for filling up any kind of niche? See, because abstractly speaking, and uh, I can forward you some papers about this, which is that you have a finite resource. Now that resource could be food, that resource could be uh, custom, you know, the market size, that resource could be uh, <coughs> housing. But be that as it may, uh, if it's a finite resource, there's, and there's a tendency for winners to accumulate more resources, which is again, true in many of these systems, you will see a power law behavior right away. Right. Um, so, so one question, and you can see that even in income distributions. So famously speaking, you know, like in the US now we know that the top 1% own about 60% of the wealth, and maybe 80% of it now. And then the top 1% of that 1% own a very large fraction of that, and so on and so forth. Right? All the way till Bill Gates and then so therefore, this question of are there, what are the universal features and what are the more specific features is an interesting thing. Uh, where it becomes slightly more complicated, and this is where there's a very interesting study. And it just came out, right? It came out here in Nature and Science, uh, uh, which is that if you look at terrestrial creatures versus aquatic creatures, the distributions are somewhat different. And it's a very, very simple reason. Terrestrial uh, uh, creatures have to hunt on land or, or graze on land, and therefore they only have a two dimensional uh, surface on which to collect resources. While both arboreal as well as um, aquatic creatures have three dimensions to do their uh, grazing or hunting. So it turns out that, therefore, the number of species and all of these that an ecosystem can support is very different in the two cases. But what's the actual relationship? That's an interesting question. So, so I don't know what dimensionality there would be for cities or countries and so on. But one of the deep questions, typically, in these kinds of issues is finding out what the effective dimension is. Meaning, if you know, broadly speaking, and I'll talk about that quite a bit in today's lecture, which is that if you know a system is, for effective purposes, three-dimensional, it gives you a lot more freedom than a system which is, for effective purposes, two-dimensional. Okay? And then finally, music genre, <coughs> since I didn't come up with it, Nishan will have to tell us what it's about. Go ahead. So uh, basically the question would be to look at uh, if a particular genre has uh, some signature style in terms of the chords it uses or the melody it uses. So like Radiohead has written this song that four chords that made a million. So it, everybody knows that one of the most popular arrangements is these four chords that you use in a major scale. And that's what uh, most popular songs use. But it's interesting to see the variation and uh, with variation if songs are liked more or not liked more. And then there's the question of, uh, you know, in classical music you have lots of uh, discordant combinations. You use notes that don't really go well together, but somehow in that context they do. And it's a lot more complicated than a lot of popular songs, so it's interesting to see that difference. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff to be explored. Uh, so the thing is, <coughs> what I discovered is, uh, looking online, uh, is that uh, we don't have to work with MP3 data. And there's uh, MIDI data, which is uh, which can be broken down into the instruments it uses and the notes it uses very easily. So uh, we've got a lot of data. Great. Do you have something? Yeah, just 
So there is some really nice software like there's some music animation machine which takes a MIDI file and it just animates it in color and it's really intuitive and you can understand the music without knowing uh, you know how to write symbols and all of that. So we're going to use that to get a feel for it, but finally the analysis will be from MIDI. <coughs> Now before I start the class, I know a few people <coughs> come later. So has everybody in this room, again, signed up for a project? Yes? Is there anybody who has not? Oh yeah, you may so, uh, Why don't you, because um, you don't even know what the projects are, but you probably heard what we were discussing. I just heard about it, I don't know what's So why don't you think about it for a minute? for a day or two and then I'll remain in you what you might be interested in. Okay. <coughs> Alright, so we start the class and today, what, it's about 5 minutes to 11, right? so we have uh, tea coming up at 11.30, <laughs> so uh, uh, we'll break for 15 minutes then, but we'll I'll see how much I can cover before that. Uh, the uh, final announcement I want to make before we start. This coming Saturday, we have this uh, DSDT meeting on social networks. So if you're interested in understanding social networks, whether from the geek side or from the nerd side, uh, do come. I think there'll be some interesting talks. So we have Girish Dalvi, who's at Yahoo Research. And Yahoo, of course, has done a tremendous amount of work on um, social networks, and he'll be talking about his work on visualizations. Uh, Professor Benny Madhavan, who's at uh, ISC, he's a computer scientist there, a senior computer scientist, and he will be talking about uh, some of the computational issues involved. So if you're crunching social networks, you have to figure out how to, what algorithms to use, let's say, to be as efficient as possible. So he'll be talking about those kinds of computational issues. And I'll be talking about sort of the more, the larger sort of theoretical issues involved in understanding networks in general and social networks in particular. This is on Saturday. This is on Saturday. And then if there is interest, we'll have what I call a thinkathon, right? So we'll take some social networks and see again if we can combine data and analysis to do something interesting. But that, of course, depends on uh, how many people are willing to hang out and take the same time. Uh, if you have a video camera and you're willing to do it, yes. No, 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 I, I cannot that, that's what I'm asking. So, so you can see what the limitation is. But we can't, uh, unless we find somebody who's willing to do it. And, uh, it can be. It's just a matter of someone with a video camera willing to show up. Well, I should say this because as you can see, Rola is videotaping today because the person, Anu, who was doing it for the last couple of sessions has become too busy and can't do it anymore. So I don't want to uh, make promises that I can't keep. All right, so today's session is on representation and measurement. So again, Anand and I are going to play you know, good cop and bad cop. You can figure out who's good and who's but our idea is that, I mean, I'll generally be talking about the theoretical issues involved, and Anand will be telling us about the nitty gritties of how to actually do that stuff. Um, but the important thing here for today is, as a scientist, um, I think of data as something which informs my exploration and research into a topic, right? So data by itself is not as important as data that helps me explain, predict, so on and so forth. And actually that's true of everybody, right? I mean, unless you are in a discipline, and this might well be true of people who work in companies that deal with data, you might have very, very well-defined workflows in which you really don't know why somebody is asking you to do what you do. So, but uh, unfortunately, we scientists don't have the luxury to hire so many people, so we have to uh, have an understanding of all of these elements ourselves. So to give you um, an example, so 
good data story that has come out in the last few days. Um, we know that, um, so you must have seen the garbage piling up on the streets in Bangalore. Now, if all I gave you was the, um, so if I, I mean, outside Bangalore, in many, many cities in India, there is always garbage piled up. So gar Bangalore, that way, happens to be a city where garbage collection works better than others. Right. So in the case of Bangalore, particularly, the reason why there was garbage piled up everywhere was because the workers were on strike. Okay. And as we know, the uh, places outside Bangalore where we were dumping our garbage refused to take it anymore. Okay. So that's a very, so the explanation for why garbage is piled up is very different here than let's say it would be in some other city. So therefore, if you want to understand why you have the fact, so if you have a lot of data from lots of cities about, let's, so and this is something I wanted to build, a trash map, right? So if you see trash anywhere on the street, you take a picture <coughs> of it and you upload it. So you can imagine that you could quickly collect a reasonably detailed trash map of Bangalore or something. <coughs> But if you want to explain why the trash is the way it is, you will have to have very different explanations for Bangalore and other cities. So the explanation is what makes research possible. <coughs> Prediction is a slightly less onerous responsibility. So you can predict things that you can't explain. Uh, but uh, even there, you need more than just correlations. Okay. Now let's see if this moves. It's not. Ah. So all data analysis requires measurement and representation. And measurement and representations are very far from clear topics. I mean, there's an immense amount of hard work that goes into understanding how to measure and how to represent. And human beings, of course, have developed several systems of measurement and, uh, you know, for analytic purposes. So things like movies are also representations, but for analytic purposes, you can say that there are about three or four different modes of representation that, broadly speaking, are the ones that we use all the time. Okay, so the three ones are numbers, stories, and images. Right? And almost all of science and almost all of analysis outside science as well depends on numerical representations. In fact, the great growth in the use of numbers comes from their usefulness as measurement and representation devices. Almost all communication depends on stories. You can't really tell somebody what's happening in the world if you can't tell a story. <clears throat> and images work for both. So, so if you think about how to therefore measure and represent, you need to figure out how to deal with numbers, you need to figure out how to tell stories. And as I will end, um, so I'm giving away the punchline, you need to tell stories with pictures that represent data. That's broadly speaking what our goal is. Okay. As soon as you say that something is representable as a number, you are already saying an enormous amount. So the lesson of the day is you know, we spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to extract patterns out of numbers. But some what I call dimensional analysis, this is what physicists and mathematicians call that is based on the fact that if something is at all representable as a number, it already is going to be something very different from a randomly chosen entity in the world. Um, and the history of science is based on this idea. Right? So Galileo, for example, uh, when he started his uh, exploration of physics, <coughs> decided that there are certain things called primary quantities, um, which now would include things like mass or uh, weight, um, temperature, so things that can be measured directly and numerically. And secondary quantities that cannot be, at least then, 
was not measurable directly, like color. Right? So wavelength is something that you can measure. You know, all you need is a spectrometer, and you can measure wavelength. Well, color, you can't measure directly. I can't actually put a, you know, a sensor on top of some entity and say, oh, this is blue. You can. Huh? You can with a spectrometer. I don't know. No, you can. You can measure it in four or five wavelengths depending on the color. Non-unprovided Well, we'll have a conversation about that because I, in the sense that color constancy, I don't think, can be predicted on wavelength. So it's probably doing a hack or something. Like that. So, we'll, 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 okay. so, so, but, but, where, so color is usually given as a prototypical example of a secondary quantity rather than a primary. And science, because from Galileo onwards, it says you have to be based only on primary quantities. It's very difficult to do sciences of things that cannot be measured directly. Right? And almost nothing incidentally can be measured directly. So for example, if, um, and we are all interested in this question. Right? So you want to understand, say, using Twitter, what ideas are popular. But you are not actually querying people on what ideas are popular. You are using surrogate quantities, like how often something is retweeted. Okay. So therefore, um, part of all data analysis is to make one thing you know, as a surrogate measure for another. So which is what representation is meant to for. Right? Representation is to make one thing stand for. So isn't this trivial? Meaning that, of course, we use numbers, we use stories, we use images. But as a physicist will tell you, the fact that something can be told as a story, the fact that something can be represented as a number, already means that it is a very, very vanishingly small percentage of all the things that could be. Right? So, so in this sense, if you think about the entropic nature of the universe, most of the universe is chaos, right? Um, and so it's only, um, unfortunately, as pattern detectors, we are uh, instinctively geared towards seeing order in the chaos, uh, It's a good thing. But uh, we should also recognize that that's not what most of the universe is about. Right? Most of the universe is very, very alien to the kind of things that we are. But given that something can be represented, that itself is a lot of information for free. Meaning that if I can tell you that something is a number, and it's related to other things that are numbers, you can very quickly figure out what kind of relationship it must be, at least up to first order. Right? So if you know <coughs> that something is a number, and it's related to other numbers. And that relationship, so I'm going to use a technical term here called non-accidentality, and I'll explain that in a minute. But if something is a number and it's related to other things in non-accidental ways, that gives us a huge leg up already right, in the prediction and explanation business. So what do I mean by non-accidental features? If you take those three, uh, bars over there. So I, I hope all of you see that these are three different situations, right? You don't need to be told what's different. I mean, they look different. So I'll tell you exactly how they are different in a minute, OK? Um, but you can see that these are different situations of arranging a dot and a line. And somehow they are distinct from each other. Informally, you can see that the first one has the dot not touching the line at all. The second one has the dot on the line, while the third one has it at one of the ends of the line. Right? And visually, it's clear that we perceive these as different situations. Okay, So already it's telling you that our minds are made in such a way that we automatically classify the world in this manner. Right? And the technical terminology for that is called partial ordering. So what do I mean by that? Suppose I take a line. So take two-dimensional space, and you draw a line somewhere. And since um, I can rename it however I want, imagine that the line 
goes from plus 1 to minus 1 on the y-axis in two-dimensional space. Okay, and I have a dot in my hand. I close my eyes and I throw the dot at random. What is the probability that it will hit that line? It's actually exactly zero. Right? Uh, uh, because in the two-dimensional space of locations, this particular line occupies what's called a zero uh, measured space. Okay? Which is why if the light dot is on the line, it is significant because you would have to do work to get the dot on the line, right? Because it doesn't happen at random. So the definition of work is something that extracts where you have to spend energy to get something to be non-random. So therefore, this second one already shows you, and our minds are made that way, to detect something that could not have been accidental. And the third one is even more non-accidental, right? So if you take a line, so say, reply, do the same experiment with a line instead of, so suppose that there was a line, and you had to throw a dot in such a way randomly somewhere on the line, with probability zero, it will land on one of the edges. <clears throat> so which is why, if you see a dot at the end of a line, you know that it is more meaningful in some sense than in the one of the ends. Right? So this hierarchy of what is more meaningful or more rare or more um, difficult uh, to achieve is in a, I would argue, is built into our perceptual and other systems. Right? So we are, as creatures, sort of hardwired to detect these kinds of patterns. And so, in some sense, what we are doing when we are building all these fancy computer systems and everything else is just souping up that innate capacity that we already have. But we should first know what is this innate capacity. Incidentally, just this, uh, so remember I was trying to tell you that just no time. With the meaning of this as a symbol, is it being uh, all accident? So what I mean is that if you take the middle one, it is uh, more non-accidental than the one on the left, right? Because it takes more work to get your dot on the line than somewhere at random. If you take the one on the right, that is even more non-accidental than the second one because it takes further work to get the dot on the end of the line than somewhere in the middle. So this is just a formal mathematical way of showing that hierarchy. So this symbol stands for non accidental. It means, I mean, this is, again, in mathematics, it's typically used for anything which is, so partial order is just any relationship where if, it's like less than or equal to, right? So less than or equal to is also partial order. Because if A is less than or equal to B and B is less than or equal to C, then A is less than or equal to C. So as long as something obeys those rules, it's called a partial order. So are we saying that, uh, this order that we uh, are not able to see is what we call chaos. But actually, if we saw the order, we realize that because there's partial knowledge. So uh, we saw that would the order, be one way of putting it, but uh, uh, a more radical claim would be that you can never get beyond partial knowledge. Uh, so, in that sense, uh, that's why. It's, so, this is standard in many, many situations. We have to give you a very different situation. People in economics, um, so Arrow and Sen in particular, figured out that you could never have a total ordering of choices. So for example, if I had to distribute resources, and here are three potential principles. Right? Principle number one, I distribute resources in such a way that the poorest person gets the biggest share. Okay. Let's take another principle. I distribute resources in such a way that the one who has put in the most labor gets the biggest share. How do you, uh, these two cannot be resolved because they are both rationally defensible. I mean, you can't tell me that either of them is wrong. And yet, they can't be simultaneously satisfied because people who are invariably putting in the work are not the ones who are the worst. So how do you um, decide between these two? So here is a situation where 
in, it's, it's not a question of there being some information that will make this complete. It's simply impossible to resolve this uh, dilemma. Right? And, and most choice making, and which is why partial orders are a very good framework, is most choice making seems to be of that kind. We are always choosing between the seemingly intractable and equally valid choices. So these patterns are partial. They're partial. Okay. Right? But what I'm trying to tell you is that even knowing that much helps gives us a lot. So our, for example, human language picks up a great deal of these partial orders. Right? So right, let's take a bottom line there. So if you look at the prepositions in English, and this is true in other languages too, uh, essentially you can classify them in, on, along, across, around. They all sort of very neatly um, fall into the different categories of partial order, right? So um, to just take the middle in the middle line, if you take across versus along, if you take a line, so if I take a, uh, an ellipse, okay, and I just draw a line at random, it is with probability one, either not going to intersect the ellipse at all, or if it intersects the ellipse, it's going to intersect it somewhere in the middle. Right? And that's what we call a cross, right? if it goes to the middle. This one here, where something goes along the boundary of an entity, is probability zero. I mean, at random, if you draw a line, it's not going to match exactly with the boundary of something. So it's a non accidental feature in that sense. So it turns out, therefore, if you work this out that human language cares about these kinds of things. So what I'm trying to emphasize here is that our basic linguistic, conceptual, and perceptual facilities are already built in pattern detectors, but with special kinds of patterns. They're not any kind of pattern, they're special kinds of patterns. Right? And representations in general, and this is what we are all in the business of in the data analysis world, are nothing but ways to harvest all these non-accidental features systematically. Like you want to be, I mean, if you want to collect uh, real patterns rather than spurious patterns, you're much better off collecting things that really come from, at least what you think, are non-accidental properties of the world. Right? Um, so let us take, uh, and, and our storytelling picks that up. So let's take this first sentence here. Right? While Ramesh was driving to his house, he remembered that he was supposed to be at a meeting, and he immediately turned around and drove back to his office. Or while Ramesh was driving to his house, he got stuck in a traffic jam behind an old red Honda. Or while Ramesh was driving to his house, he turned into a dragon and ate a couple of pedestrians. So you might think that the third one is very different from the first two, but the third one strikes us like a story, but the first two don't. But they all have a very similar structure. So if you so if you forgot the content, you remove the dragon and things like that, and you looked at the structure, and this is what was done by people like Vladimir Kopp, a very famous Russian, I don't know what to call him, a mythologist. But he, he studied uh, folk tales and other things for him. And people uh, and others too, uh, where um, so another very famous person in this sort of world is Joseph Campbell. Yeah, you might have heard of him. He, he wrote this book called The Hero's Journey. Uh, you should read it. So, what they basically said is stories have similar structure throughout the world. And I'll come to that later on in the second half of today's presentation. But the idea is that stories are also picking up the same kind of non-accidental features that the um, perceptual and other capacities are. So if you take the first one, you can literally draw it as a diagram. Unfortunately, there's no whiteboard here, but you imagine yeah. this. Huh? Yeah. Is oh, yeah. So let's right, So basically, if you think of this as the office, this is home, it's very clear that Ramesh's trajectory was something like this, right? I mean, it's 
So this is your end of the line. This is your non-accidental feature. That's another non-accidental feature, and that's another one. So it's very simple to see how these kinds of linear representations with those inflection points are the ones that drive the story. Right? So at any every point, so the, the words mark out all those elements in the script, in the diagram, right? So there was the office where he started. He left there, he was driving to his house. So there is a dotted line, let's say. But then there's an inflection point where he remembers that he had to come back for a meeting, so he turns around. Right? So in that sense, the narrative force of the story, which is just that one line here, has the same kind of um, features encoded into it as the visual representation of it. Okay? And, uh, the last one is particularly interesting because, again, those pivot points, like turning into a dragon, so you have certain places where there's a state change. Right? So he was Ramesh till time T equals T1, and then he becomes dragon from then on. And then, of course, ET, the pedestrians, happens at that point. Right? So these kinds <coughs> of, so people are now coming up with very, very interesting Analyses. They're not necessarily doing it in this way. They're using more statistically driven tools. But the idea is that if you can harvest story patterns, obviously you can then start generating those automatically as well. Right? So there's a company called Narrative Science, which is now, um, you are not going to get Hamlet out of Narrative Science, not yet anywhere. Uh, but uh, many, many companies, and I don't know, I'm sure there are newspapers in India, I mean, after all, if they do paid advertising, they must be doing this too. Uh, but the Forbes and some of the other American magazines I know are using narrative sciences technology that all you have to do is to give it some data. So for example, let's say that there is, a, I mean, you know, in the US, a lot of news coverage is local. So it's here, right? So suppose that Sesha Dripuram High school plays with, uh, you know, uh, Matikere High School. Uh, and they play cricket, and uh, Matikere wins by you know, 14 runs and 3 wickets. Okay? Your local newspaper doesn't have, I mean, it costs a lot of money to send somebody to report on this for 3 hours. So instead, what narrative science does is, as long as you get the facts right, so suppose that it, so it builds a database, it has all these agents in it, so say Shaji Puram and Matika and all that, and it will just convert those raw facts into a story, right? So, it, so, so what's very interesting therefore is, once you know the general patterns of storytelling, so sports stories have an invariable pattern. So one kind of pattern in a sto sports story is clash of the titans. Okay. Another kind of pattern in, the, in a sports story is David meets Goliath. So these are sort of very, very fixed patterns of sports storytelling. I don't mean that that's the way all sports matches occur. Typically, it's the Goliath that wins. But, uh, but there's a way of writing uh, sports stories. And if you know those patterns and you plug in some data, you can get a serviceable sports story out for and farm those in a big way. So in that sense, what we want right, is to go from an experience, so whether it is seeing, um, so you take an experience, which is what we all start with, whenever we are telling stories or we are representing using numbers and so on, the beginning point is always somebody's experience of the world. This is not machine uh, analysis. Because a machine doesn't care about the things that we do. I don't know, there's this famous uh, Philip K. Dick uh, story, right? Do androids have electric dreams? Okay, so I mean, we don't. We don't have electric dreams. And so therefore, to the extent that you are customers or your scientists or whoever are people, you have to make sure that you represent and narrate your world in a way that people care about. And therefore, the experience has to be converted into a representation. 
that representation has to be automated. And then, of course, the automated analysis has to feed back into experience. This is broadly speaking the cycle that we are occupying. Okay. So how do you go from ideas to representations? So you might have a hunch. You might have a hunch that school marks don't really depend on how smart you are. It <coughs> depends a lot more on where you live and what caste you have and uh, <coughs> what kind of resources your family has. Right? So for example, um, let's take IIT results. IITs are supposed to be the pure meritocracy of India. I went to one, so. <laughs> Really worked. Uh, but IITs, if you look at who gets into IITs now, the best predictor of getting into an IIT now is if you go to a few coaching institutes or a few schools. Right? So if you're in Bangalore and you want to get into IIT, your best bet is join NPS and get into PACE. Ideally, both of them. If you are in Delhi, I don't know, DPS used to be, I don't know if it's still the uh, gold standard of IIT uh, uh, training. Uh, and then there is FITG and other uh, institutions. There are, interestingly enough, there are small towns like Kota. In fact, people are now yeah, sending their kids to Kota for a couple yeah, of years. Like the, the of IIT, in fact, I think a great story, a documentary could be made about just traveling to all these pilgrimage places. <laughs> this is the Devasthana of modern India. So you can go from one uh, IIT training, you know, all these small towns where they are sending kids to IITs. But nevertheless, it's clear that something which is not really innate talent, whatever that means, is at the heart of doing well school. But how do you test this? How do you actually make this into an analytic piece of work rather than just a hunch? Now, if all you have to do is to decide where to send your kids to school, or maybe a hunch is enough. But sometimes, as you know, these things are overinflated. So it may turn out that quota is not any better at sending your kids to school, I mean to IIT, than uh, you know, your random particular high school. But, uh, so unless you have a way to back up your hunch with real analysis, you are not going to get uh, good data. So how does one measure and represent class? Right, so if it turns out that class is the most important thing, now class is one of those non-extensive variables, right? meaning it's not that word, you know, people are walking around with class written on their head, you know, right? Class is measured through all kinds of surrogate means, like how you, how much wealth you have, what caste you have in India, maybe in the Western world it would be race, in China it might be ethnicity, all of those things. So we don't actually know what is the, way, what is the surrogate measure of the variable that you are really interested in. And you have to spend a little bit of time trying to say that yes, this is indeed the variable through which I'm going to get to class. Is the previous problem that you are talking about as a cooking to flourishing restaurant? Uh, that is I think there is a, there is an interesting trend not only related with coaching institutes or clusters. It's, it's the trend is related with the building a cluster at a particular place. Like Bangalore is an IIT hub. Uh, okay. And it pulls all other. Talent get uh, trapped over here any, anyhow. There can be some other place which can be flourishing in that same. In coaching. Same, yeah, they are coaching. So Kota clearly has mm -hmm. become a coaching hub, right? Yeah, so yeah. it will be interesting to find out. And Patna again, is, well, Patna again is. Yes. Full of road road is full of IT coaching. No, but my point is again to find out that if you okay, so here is a so suppose that you want to develop a coaching hub. What is the first? So it, my sense is that if you successfully prove your coaching strength in IIT, 
because it's again socially at the top of the total pole. Maybe uh, uh, medical entrance might be similar. So if you can establish yourself, yourself in that space, I wouldn't be surprised if other kinds of coaching also develop around it. This is incidentally a very different way NCBS is strategy for growing as a biotech sector. Right? So MC, uh, the National Center for Biological Sciences up the road um, on Bellary Road um, is India's premier biology research institution. So now what they're doing is they're saying now that we do pure biology research well, let's build a ring around that to do applied biology research. And let's bring, uh, build another ring around that which does which is a company or a biotech incubator where companies can come and hang out. So that's what MIT did. Right? So Cambridge is a great, Cambridge, Massachusetts, is a great uh, technology hub because you have this common, so universities traditionally are one of the biggest predictors of economic growth. For that reason, because creating knowledge, especially now in modern terminology, knowledge capital leads to real capital now. Right? But I, again, that, this would be your comparative ecology project. So if you can suck resources into IITs, potentially you can do that for other things. That's fine. I don't know. But that's, it's an empirical question and well, well worth investigating. It might be interesting to find out if small towns have succeeded. Because this is obviously something which where big cities will have an advantage. Right? Because you'll have people with the money, the desire, all those things. So what makes a small town like Kota? Or I don't know whether there are other small towns. Yeah, wait. Huh? There, are, there are not many. Huh. So, so it'll be interesting to find out what, if any, are the distinguishing characteristics of these small towns that have succeeded in developing coaching. Suppose that a surrogate numerical variable is available. Right? What I'm trying to therefore convince you is that just knowing that that is there already gives you something. And let's break. We'll come back in 15 minutes. We'll get into the physics and that's